Very good. Thank you, Beth. Uh, once again, uh, thank you to everyone for coming today. Uh, really excited to be sharing this with you. So my name is Will Anderson, and I'm a software architect. Uh, I design software systems. I manage projects. I have enterprise level visibility and impact. And I get to act as an internal consultant where I advise customers throughout the enterprise on architecture, detailed design, project design, and project management. Today, I'm going to be discussing project design and the impact that it has on organizations. And I'll be sharing some observations I've made about the dynamics that are in play while working on these kinds of software projects. So to that end, I'm actually going to be sharing a retrospective about a project I designed and executed. However, for a lot of this stuff to make sense, I'm going to need to talk about the design of the project itself and give some context about the system that we actually built. What I really want to talk about in the second half of the session is in the second half of the session, but to get there, I'm going to have to work through this other stuff. Specifically, I'm going to walk through a few snapshots we made during the project execution and design and so we can observe how the project lived and breathed and how little adjustments we made during the process impacted it later on. Once that's finished, we'll look at the final results compared uh, to what could have been. Uh, and then we'll look at some observations that I've made during the process and several others like it. And finally, we'll move on to the impact this has had on my career. Before we get going with that, we need to talk about the organization, though. And I want to do that because it's absolutely vital that you understand the company that you're working at, uh, its culture, its quirks, because that's vital to being successful there. This organization is a multi-billion dollar logistics provider, and it's fairly traditional and very well established. Uh, we had just celebrated our 100th anniversary at this time. We have over 10,000 employees uh, across hundreds of locations all throughout the United States. From an IT point of view, it's a fairly typical mid-sized shop with maybe 250 total employees. From a technology perspective, it's kind of a zoo, though. Everything from .NET to COBOL, everything in between. And we're currently experiencing a lot of the growing pains associated with maturing our dev shop. The culture itself is really good, though. The average tenure is something like 15 years. Specialization tends to be uncommon. And we tend to struggle with large projects that have tight deadlines and budgets. But we absolutely excel at meeting customers' daily needs. Most people, though, tend to struggle with some of those large budgets and large uh, or tight budgets and tight deadlines and, and those large initiatives. So that's not really shocking. Today, I want to talk about how we discovered iDesign, how we engaged iDesign and discovered that we were doing things wrong. And so was everybody else. We also figured out that we could do it much better. To that end, we embraced the system design side of the product design or the iDesign method. And we started seeing a lot of really positive changes. Our systems became a lot more consistent, easier to develop, but the projects we were doing were so unpredictable. Our users were still disappointed, and so was everybody else. And we knew that we could do a lot better. Today, I want to talk about the system that we built. And for those of you who haven't been to the Architects Master Class, this might not mean a whole lot to you, but this is essentially the design of the system. And it's, it was a brownfield effort, and a lot of the complexity was derived from the fact that we had so many pre-existing requirements to fulfill. There's something like 15 years of code here that people were convinced would need to be referenced and rewritten. And I was brought into the mix with the request of the manager because we had a tight deadline, and her team seemed to think that it was going to take like nine months or even a year to get this thing to market when really they had about six months. When they brought me in and asked to help out, I obviously agreed and we figured out a few things about the nature of the system. First and foremost was that it directly impacted sales and commissions. And so there was very low tolerance for defects. And the team that I was working with had been supporting this thing for the last decade or so and really believed that it was going to be a monster of a project. And the manager believed them. And so we kind of went to the to the drawing board, and in about two days, we had a full system design, and the manager was amazed. And she asked a really good question, though. She said, how do we build it? Now, I've got to give her, give her credit here, because it's a fantastic question, and not one that uh, people ask, usually, knowing truly what it means. And so I simply came back and said, give me two days, and I can tell you. So the answer was project design. So what, what you're looking at here is it's called a project network. This is actually a model for your project, how it's going to execute, how it's going to live and breathe. Um, when you get good at these things, you can actually look at them and, and even figure out what your staffing is going to look like. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really just a visual representation of what your project is going to be. 
The project itself was influenced by a number of factors. Uh, the budget was really tight. Uh, our deadline was even tighter. And we had a relative inexperience on the project. So even if we had money to get Rockstar developers, there was no one in the organization we could really use for that purpose. And so we created two separate design options to accommodate some of these things. And when I look back at it, I maybe should have done more. Um, five or six would have been better, perhaps cover some different staffing scenarios and schedule scenarios. But even the two that I did made a world of difference. And it gave me a ton of insight into the nature of the project. This is our staffing distribution for the two developer option. Now, all a staffing distribution really is is a uh, chart that allows you to plot your resources as a, as a function of time. And it lets you visualize how your resources are going to roll on the project and roll off of the project. And it also allows you to understand the true cost. The other thing that's interesting to know is that project design doesn't just give you a cost and duration for the project, but also gives you a measure for viability. For example, we can calculate things like efficiency and risk. And in this situation, the efficiency is too high and the risk is too. And that actually makes sense once you understand what's going on with project design. Because once you understand some of these things, you'll understand that projects that are run with a high degree of risk actually give the appearance of being highly efficient, which sounds great to some people, but when you get involved with these things, you'll start to see that that can mean death for a project before a line of code is ever written. We also did a plan for three developers. And same situation here, except for using additional resources. I do want you to notice, though, how smoothly this chart ramps up and down. And so this is a good sign that you're not being overly aggressive in your staffing strategy. You'll notice that project design can often give you very counterintuitive results. So notice here that even though I use an extra developer, that this project actually was done for less money than the two developer option. And that's because we are able to get it done faster. And because we can get it done faster, we can use fewer indirect resources. Our efficiency also came down quite a bit to 24%, which while still on the high side is, is viable. And our risk at 0 0.77 is more acceptable. Now there are some things going on here that uh, I haven't talked about yet, we'll get into it in a moment, um, why some of these numbers are high, but this is what we went with. In fact, I was able to use this as justification for getting a third developer on the project because I could show the organization that if they gave me another developer that I could actually get this done faster and cheaper. And so when we presented these plans to them, they went with a three developer option and we started the project later that month. So the team itself was basically this, two young pups and an older area dev who knew a ton of COBOL and was fantastic on the business, but wasn't great in the new SOA land that we were playing in. Good people and ended up being a great team. You'll find that just like in, in, in your organizations, I don't often get to pick the exact people on my team. And neither will you. You've got to get, you've got to make the team that you have work for you. You're not going to get the, the Avengers every time. So we kicked off the project using the design as our guide, and this was our plan to earn value as a function of time. So if you've ever done anything with with earn value charts uh, or project management, this will look familiar. If not, really all this blue line represents is, is how we are planning to to to. Uh, uh, earn value over time, what tasks we're going to accomplish and when. And this is a very nice shallow S shape, which again indicates that we're not being too aggressive in what we're trying to accomplish. So on week four, I was taking measurements every week. On week four, I started noticing some disturbing trends in the project. And if you'll look at these green dotted dashed lines, that's a projection of the actual earned value that we've achieved on the project. And it's right where it needs to be. But if you look at the red line, which is our actual effort, and the red dashed line, which is a projection of that actual effort, we are way below what we should have been spending. And so the veterans of the architect master's class are gonna remember the slide that I'm about to show, because with this information, we're able to diagnose a certain behavior on this project. Namely, that the team was sandbagging. And that's some of the information that I wasn't sharing uh, earlier in the, the presentation. That's why some of the risk numbers didn't bug me. We knew that some of the estimates could possibly be high, but we weren't at, in a place where we could fight that at the time. And so instead, we, we simply 
made some agreements with the management that if we saw things behaving differently than expected, that we would make adjustments. And so that was, that's what we did. We made a handful of adjustments to bring this back into alignment. And by week 10, the project started looking like this. Now, essentially, all that's really happening here is if you'll look at the red line that represents our actual effort, you notice that it's now beginning to converge with the blue line that represents our planned earned value. And so this is just the medicine kicking in. The green line is still right where it needs to be because all we did was take those estimates that were too large and make them uh, smaller so they fit into reality. And then we just continued down this road until we got to the end of the project and we installed. This is what our final results look like. So first things first, you have a schedule variance of 1.6%. We actually installed this a day ahead of schedule. But we didn't close out the project until two days after that because the manager felt a little nervous. Um, she wasn't used to things necessarily installing right on time. The effort, though, is another story. The 7.3% variance was a little bit outside of my, my, my target. It could have been something more like 3%. But I didn't adjust early enough when we saw the behavior on the sandbagging. So this is a very succinct graph of how the project actually behaved. So even though we got down to that 7% variance, you'll notice the chart still shows evidence of sandbagging. Again, have we taken some earlier action on this? Maybe we could have gotten this down to 3% or so. The other thing that's really interesting to me and why I love this and why it's so powerful is that it truly is a microscope into your project. If you have something like this, it's literally a, a, a weapon that you can wield to fight off the crazy uh, plans that people have that don't fit into any, any, any version of reality that ever existed. It also allows you to very quickly adjust plans for reality so that you can meet your commitments and keep your stakeholders happy and keep your company moving forward in the right direction. So now the reason we're all here is to actually do the retrospective. So everything that came before this is really just kind of set the stage for some of these things that I'm going to be talking about now. So first things first is that estimations matter. They really do. But they don't matter nearly as much as your project network. And the project this evening actually was a really good example, or, or today was a really good example of that. The, the estimates themselves were only useful in that they allowed us to create a project network. And once we had that project network in place, we could really easily adjust the estimations that made up the individual activities. And then the network simply responded to that. And so in, in a very real sense, that project network protect, protected me, protected the team from the missed estimations, both the, the big ones and the little ones. So it, takes, it, it pays off to take the time to create these things and put the hard work in, the, in what it takes to make them. Next, you don't have to win every single battle. In fact, I will tell you to choose your battles very wisely because you only have so much capital that you can expend when it comes to fighting some of these things. And so don't fight about things that, that don't really matter in the long term. So for example, I could have fought <clears throat> during the estimation sessions about some of the some of the overestimations that I suspected were happening, but instead I let that stuff go because I knew that the the, the nature of the network was still true. Because if they were adjusting or overestimating on one item, they were really overestimating on everything. And so because of that, the nature of the network had changed. So instead, I let the project do the talking for me. And within four weeks, we saw that we weren't spending as much money as we thought we would, and so we were able to make adjustments which also brought our timeline back a little bit. And the other thing, too, is, is that when you do this, you don't really have to be perfect. A simple plan like the one that we did uh, that I showed you today will give you an, an amazing advantage. In fact, when everyone around you is kind of stumbling in the dark and trying to figure out how their project's going to execute, if they even have that concept, is essentially blind. And so it just gives you an amazing advantage. The other thing is that you, you, we have to accept at a certain point that our profession isn't very different from any other in the world. Uh, nearly every team that you, you're ever going to be a part of is, at the end of the day, going to be average. That's never fun to hear, but that's how it works. And the truth is, is that you can develop great software with any team, but you're going to have to do it with the team you have, not the team you wish you had. Instead, you should invest your energy in fighting those battles that will make a difference. And those battles re revolve around solid engineering, good design, and good leadership. If you have that trifecta, you're going to ensure that these average teams can deliver great software. But if you miss a single facet, you're going to stumble badly. 
The other thing I've noticed a lot of lately is how terrified people are industry seem to be when it comes to negotiating. So you have to understand that negotiation is our lifeblood. In fact, the first thing that you're ever going to sell as an architect is yourself. But you never really stop doing it, and you'll do it a thousand times throughout every single project. So you can't be afraid to engage with leaders. If you need something, you've got to ask for it. And you're going to be surprised if the door is going to open for you. But the kicker is this. You have to negotiate from a position of knowledge and a visibility and of numbers. And that's exactly what project design can give you. Next, we have to understand that success really is foreign to many teams. It's unfamiliar and a little frightening. In the last three years or so, I've had a lot of really good software to market. And I've had to help my team come to terms with the fact that good things were happening time and time again. So I do silly stuff. I celebrate with lunches and we do goofy awards, all kinds of stuff like that. You've got to give them time to get used and to acclimate the fact that they could deliver this stuff because what the industry at large teaches them is that they, they're just going to refactor endlessly and somehow it's going to become better. And if you've ever been in that trap, you know that's just not true. Next, success is addictive. Once people are exposed to the power of project design, to a good system design, they never want to go back, even when it's not perfect. So I want to conclude a little bit by sharing some of the ways that this has impacted my career. Project design has really helped me hone uh, broad leadership skills so that I'm no longer just a tech guy. And that's because I'm able to speak the language of my leaders and also be effective on the technical side of things. In that time, my confidence has skyrocketed. As I said, I've, I've brought millions of dollars of software to, uh, to, to market on time and on budget and on quality. So I, I now have the opportunity to act as an advisor to CMP level leadership. And that continues to open up just a, a whole world of opportunities for me. And truly, this is a, a very common pattern. It's not just me. We have iDesign alumni all around the world who are moving into these incredibly influential positions as senior architects, CIOs, CTOs. And the reason why is that we continue to build trust, we add value, we deliver success, and again, we speak their language. Some final thoughts. Small projects are a great place to practice. There are fewer barriers to entry. You don't have to find as much to use project design. Sometimes they don't even know that it's going on until you save them from some kind of disaster. It's less complicated generally. It helps you build confidence and it proves your methods work. And plus, most of what you do in your career is going to be made up of three and six month projects anyways. Most people don't get handed to your projects as a, as a matter of routine. Interestingly enough, though, as you, as you do these things, and you actually start executing and delivering on them, uh, you'll find that they start pegging you to do some of those bigger projects. And so that outlier effect kind of kicks in, where because you show that you can deliver on these smaller things, they actually start throwing work at you. Um, and you get better as a result of it, which is really neat and kind of a, a not phenomenon. The next thing is that a well-designed project should be a toy to be a part of. It's really and truly a win-win for the team and for the organization. But you have to understand that there's no silver bullet. The truth is, is that with anything, you've got to work really hard to win a project design. You've got to work really hard to win an execution. You've got to work really hard to get a great design. But project design can absolutely supercharge your efforts. Finally, I want to reflect a little bit on the iDesign method and what it truly means. So the Architects Master's class teaches you what to do, but the Project Design Master class teaches you how to do it. And so if you think about it in that way, you'll see that the iDesign method is really a formula that has two parts. It's a method for system design, and it's a method for project design. Either part when taking a low is error, although and you'll find you, you need both to succeed. Some resources for you. On the Autodesign website, we have a ton of resources on project design, uh, from talking points to webcast. If you're an alumni, you can find a wealth of information on the Autodesign alumni forums, which is home to some of the best minds in our industry, quite honestly. Uh, and it's probably the best place that I know of to discuss project and system design. Uh, finally, we do have some upcoming master classes. We have the Architects master class and the Project Design Masterclass, which is a week-long immersion in project design. You spend uh, a full week learning from you all about the ins and outs of project design. And the answer to that, too, is the Project Design Clinic, 
And essentially what that is is a, a condensation of something like 10 years of practice into an intense week of, of full-on hands-on learning. So thank you guys for your time. All right, thanks everybody for joining today. Thank you guys.